Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Carrie. I'm the Coffee and Conversation Counselor, and I'm uh, pleased to be joining you here today to talk about um, how can we talk to our kids about COVID-19. And I'm really glad that you can join us here. I know that people are going to be kind of coming in a little bit at a time, so we'll give people a, a chance to, to get uh, logged in and I know that a lot of these platforms are a little bit overwhelmed right now as a lot of us are as well so we'll just take a minute to let people get signed in kind of get comfortable grab your coffee um, and we'll get started in just a couple minutes um, but while we're waiting I'll give you a little background right here uh, I normally work out of an office in Riverview New Brunswick and with everything that's been going on I have left my office and I'm in the cottage so that's why you see all this nautical decor behind me. So it's a, it's a little bit of a strange new world for all of us. So uh, I'm really glad that you can join us. And I know that it's really, it's really hard to know what to do, what to say. What do we do? Well, you know what? The COVID-19 virus has been everywhere. Front page of newspapers, every bit of social media, um, even before we, we went to, you know, canceling schools and daycares, it was at the playground, it was in the workplace. And a lot of parents are really wondering how to bring up this pandemic to their kids in a way that will be both reassuring and will prevent their kids from worrying further than they need to. And it's a really challenging time. Let's be honest, it's challenging for children, it's challenging for adolescents. A lot of them may not really understand the reasons for school closures, the cancellation of their extracurricular activities. I mean, I remember talking to some families a couple of weeks ago when hockey season was canceled and just the heartbreak of some of those kids and the, the really not understanding. Some of these kids as they're a little bit older are just being bombarded through social media with information and misinformation and getting, getting mixed messages from their friends that can cause them a lot of anxiety and alarm. So it's not surprising that you as parents would be trying to find ways to navigate this. What's also really important to note is that young people from, from you know, kind of toddlers on up can also feel our sense of anxiety. They can tune into that. And they may be worried about the health and welfare of their own family members. And, you know, little kids, for example, might be wondering why they can't still hug their grandparents, why they can't, play with their friends, why they, they can't have a play date. So we're gonna talk about all of those things today. So what I'm gonna ask is that if you have any questions that you just type them into your chat function. And at the end of the presentation, I will address the questions. That way none get lost in the shuffle. Um, you'll notice that you are muted and the only video is, is me. Um, so that way we can just really focus on the information and I'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so. Let's talk. One of the most important things that we need to remember is that having a conversation is important. It is really important for us to talk to our kids, to share with them in a way that is appropriate. We can't do that if we're filled with anxiety. So the first thing we're going to do for ourselves is breathe. And anybody who has tuned into any of my Facebook lives or has been a client in my practice, knows that I advocate for four, seven, eight breathing. So together, I'm gonna to encourage you to inhale through your nose for four, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. So I'm gonna count out from my hands, and here we go. Inhale, hold, exhale. Okay, so we've breathed. What's really great about that, when we do mindful breathing, it helps reduce the cortisol production and cortisol is our stress hormone. Right now, we're really, really being intentional about washing our hands. We wash our hands for 20 seconds. The four, seven, eight breathing is 19 seconds. So what a great place to practice it. So practice breathing before you talk to your kids. That way you're calmer, your cortisol is dropped and you can be ready to talk to them. Don't be afraid. It's okay to talk about it. When we don't talk with our kids about something that is worrisome, it can actually make them worry more. We want to create an open and supportive environment where children know that they can ask questions. 
at the same time, it's important to not force them to have a conversation with something that they're not ready to talk about. And most of our kids, regardless of their age, will have already seen or heard something about the virus. They may have seen people wearing face masks. They may have seen news articles. So we shouldn't avoid talking about it at all. We need to look at the conversation as, as an opportunity, an opportunity to convey the facts, set the emotional tone, and to really be that resource for our kids. We set the tone. We are the one who takes on the news from social media, from the news reports, from whatever, and we filter it for our kids. We filter it so that they get it in an appropriate fashion. Our goal is to help our children feel informed, get really fact-based information, and let them feel reassured. Uh, because right now, they're probably feeling a little bit at sea, which so many of us are as well. So let's talk about how we can do this. So a great way is to consider a family meeting, whatever your family unit looks like, whether it's mom and dad, mom and mom, dad and dad, just mom, just dad, grandparents, um, you know, foster family. Families come in so many shapes and sizes. But consider a family meeting. This is your chance to acknowledge their fears. You know what, so often we're told, oh, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I don't know about you, but for me, if someone says to me, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, oh my gosh, I am worrying even more. So acknowledge their fears. Then explain, explain that, you know, through using good resourcing, like the Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, um, Health Canada, um, Provincial Department of Health, explain the overall risk of getting the virus, and of course, in age appropriate terms, and what happens if you do get sick. So I'm not gonna tell you how to say that, you can choose your own language for that, but looking at the information about what it means for young people and what it means in terms of how they will feel. Outline the steps you're taking to keep them safe. So you can talk about the hand washing, you can talk about the physical distancing, you can talk about the, the self-isolation for people who have been traveling, you can talk about only one person going out. You can talk about not going to playgrounds and so on. And explain that these are things that we are doing as the grown-ups to take care, to take care of them and to keep everyone safe and healthy. You can reassure your children that um, statistically, young children and, and youth tend to get a very mild form if they're afraid for their own health. And you can discuss any questions that they might have. And of course, we're going to discuss how to do that. First, we need to find out what they already know, right? We, we don't know it though. I had a conversation with my 10 year old this morning at the breakfast table and I was asking her, what does she already know? And she's like, I don't know. I know that I'm not allowed to hang out with my grandparents. And that was about it. And I said, well, you know, what questions do you have? And she's like, well, when can I go back to school? And I said, well, that's a really great question. And I don't really know the answer to that but we're gonna stay really on top of, of listening to the recommendation from the experts. So finding out what they already know and really following your child's lead about what they want to ask, right? Because maybe that's all they need to know. Maybe they're comfortable with just knowing when is school back in or when do I get to see my friends? So taking their lead is really important. And of course, being developmentally appropriate. Having a conversation with my 10 year old is very different than having a conversation with my four year old. They are developmentally different. So one of the important things is to not volunteer too much information. We don't want to supply them with stats around mortality rates or maybe increasing rates of exponential growth. This can be really overwhelming. It's overwhelming for me as an adult. Imagine for a little person. So instead, answer their questions. Do your best to, to answer clearly. And it's okay if you can't answer everything. The most important thing is being available to your child when they need you. When you start to ask those questions, be sure to gear them to your child's age level. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. So, you know, for little, little kids, you might say, have you heard grownups talking about anything? And for your older teens, for example, you might say, you know, what are you and your friends talking about? And this gives you that chance to learn as much as you can about whether your kids have good information or wrong information. So let's talk about the earliest childhood. So this would be, you know, infant to toddler. So as I mentioned, as we got started, 
kids can feel our calm or our anxiety. So we want to try to stay as calm as possible. <laughs> that can be really hard, right? So again, the four, seven, eight breathing, avoid um, talking about difficult subjects with your partner or with other adults when children are around. It's really important to maintain routine. So even though our babies and toddlers may not fully understand what's going on, they kind of have that sixth sense and they pick up on our energy, on our, on our own um, nervousness or calm. Maintaining that routine and deviating as little as possible from the routine is going to help them feel safe and calm. It might sound silly, um, but we want to shield them from, from media coverage as much as possible. Not necessarily understand the words, but they may understand the tone and that can um, make them feel anxious. So in that age group, the toddler and the, and the, the infant, we're going to be looking for those nonverbal signs of anxiety. Um, clingy, weepy, um, irritable. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm describing a toddler in many senses there, but we want to be aware of these things. Maybe they're, if you're an essential worker and your child's still going to daycare, um, maybe it's about a reluctance to go to daycare, maybe some separation anxiety. So this would be an important time to provide some extra reassurances and maybe some extra time together when you can. Again, as I mentioned earlier, take the lead from your toddler. Don't talk about things unless they show specific signs of distress or unless they ask questions. In other words, with babies and toddlers, it's business as usual. Reassuring, cuddling, holding, bedtime, stories, keep things going, the way that you normally do. With our preschoolers, so this would be my four-year-old, these guys are, are curious, right? They're a little more tuned in to the world around them. Um, at this age, normal questions often re revolve around um, illness and death, um, doctors and germs. I mean, if they're in daycare, for example, they've already been talking about germs and hand washing. So this is just another extension of that. For them, safety really is a primary concern. They want to know that they're safe. They need to know that they're safe. Um, this is where it's really important to remind them and reassure them that the grown-ups are in charge, that they're taking care, and that they're working to keep everyone safe, healthy, and, and secure. We can remind them about washing their hands, right? It's, it's something they know how to do. Um, you can sing fun songs when you're doing that. Um, you know, whether it's the happy birthday song, whether it's, um, you know, <laughs> let it go. Cause you know, we all love frozen or the, or, you know, uh, into the unknown. <laughs> um, so there are things that we can do to make washing your hands feel better. And that can help them feel like they're doing something. Preschoolers are also concerned with the health and well-being of their, of their immediate circle. So that'd be friends, parents, other relatives. So we want to make sure that we reassure them that everyone is doing what they can to stay healthy. So you can tell them, you know, well, you know what? Grammy is staying at her house so that she can stay healthy. And yeah, Grammy's washing her hands and she's taking care and everybody's doing what they can to stay healthy. And it's important to reassure them the people that they care about are being, are being healthy and mindful as well. It's really important as well to notice, and I have a note here about limiting media exposure. At this age, children have a very difficult time distinguishing between fantasy and reality, right? This is where imaginative play becomes very, very important, where kids really dig into like the imaginary friends or playing with, with characters. So limiting media exposure is going to be really important because they're not always going to be able to distinguish between what they see on the news or um, in, in news reports versus what's actually happening at home. And they may create a scarier fantasy world. So it's really important to, to shield them from that. Just like with our, our younger children, it's important to look for those nonverbals. What are the things that are telling you that your child is anxious? Now, as the parents, you have a really good sense. You know your child better than anybody else. You know when something's off. So again, this might be uh, acting scared, extra weepy, extra clingy, um, maybe a little bit disruptive or disobedient. These would be very 
very um, common signs of anxiety in a preschooler. Once again, maintaining normal routines as much as possible is critical. At this age, um, bedtime, storybooks, tuck-ins are really crucial. That feeling of safety and security and normalcy at bedtime. So if your normal bedtime routine is bath, story, snuggle, sleep, keep doing it. Keep doing bath, story, snuggle, sleep. Try to keep the same bedtimes as much as possible. It's really important to do that because that gives a sense of safety and security. Lots of hugs, <laughs> lots and lots and lots of physical reassurance, right? And I know that we're talking about physical distancing, but we're not talking about that necessarily in our intimate family groups, unless somebody is an essential worker and maybe potentially bringing um, infection home. So we, we have to be, of course, um, following Department of Health recommendations there. Kids need contact, right? They need that security. So when you can give those hugs and physical reassurance, snuggling on the couch to watch a movie, you know, um, cuddling in bed together to read a book. These are important things. And again, as with earlier ages, take the lead from your preschooler. Only speak to them about what they ask about. Avoid talking about COVID, avoid insisting on talking about it unless they really start asking questions. That's a really important thing to remember. Elementary kids, so these are kids, you know, kind of K to five. Um, they're gonna be much more aware of what's going on, right? Before school was canceled, they were probably having discussion at school with their friends. Um, some of them may have had sports, um, music, dance, other extracurriculars canceled. So they've already been having those conversations with their peers. And um, it's important to, to kind of acknowledge that, to talk to them talk to them and I can't stress the communication enough. Explain what happened, um, but still reassure them again that you're doing everything you can to keep them healthy and safe. Again, as with the toddler's age, this group is really concerned about not just their own health, but the health of their family and friends. They might be asking, but well, what about my friend Sally or my friend Joe? Are they okay? And so you know, doing things like connecting them with a friend via FaceTime or, or Facebook Messenger can be helpful for them to feel that their friends are safe as well. Um, as part of that, they may be really concerned about older family members. They may have heard that kids do better with COVID, but that older people don't do so well. And they be, might be really concerned about, you know, older grandparents or older aunts and uncles. So it'd be really important for them to maybe have contact via phone, um, video chat, and so on, so that they feel safe and help, again, reassure them that Grammy and Grampy are taking the appropriate precautions. One of the things that we don't talk about very much, but that this age can be really worried about is money. Um, they, may, they may be aware that many of us um, are no longer working as a result of the state of emergency here in New Brunswick. And they may be wondering and worried about, well, what's going to happen? How are we going to pay for things like food? How are we going to pay for groceries and, and, and gas and, 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 and? It's really important to help them understand that adults look after that, that it's the grown-ups that need to worry about that, not them. And that again, as the grown-ups, we are doing everything we can to make sure that they are safe. And I know that as adults, we may all have our own anxieties and worries about the financial uh, impact of this virus, but we don't want to transmit that anxiety to our kids. At this age, oof, they might be extra grouchy and irritable. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if they're a little more sensitive or touchy. And it's really important that as the parents, as the caregivers, that we're a little bit more patient you know, extend them a little more grace and compassion around some of, some of the sauciness or the back talk. This is a confusing time for them. And it's really hard. It's confusing for all of us. And we're coming at it from an adult lens of experience and rational, you know, um, intellectual thought. And they're coming at purely from that instinctual fear place. So it's really important that we give them that little bit of extra room to feel what they feel. Um, as with other ages, uh, limit the media coverage. You know, um, at this age, they're starting to process it more, but they still aren't necessarily um, 
processing it intellectually. So it may be very fear driven what they see. Um, so for example, you know, my 10 year old said last night that it was illegal for children to be with their grandparents. And that was her interpretation of, you know, avoid sending your children to be with elderly parents um, or grandparents. And so she was very fearful about that. And what does that mean? So making sure that we limit that, that media coverage so that they're not getting mis, not misinformation, but misinterpretation of information. Again, trying to really, really continue those normal home routines. You know, that's important for us too, right? But for kids, especially at bedtime at this age, maybe our, our routines are a little bit disrupted because school has been canceled and other activities are canceled. And, you know, explaining that this is part of the precaution for, for keeping us all well is important. But it may seem like a bit of a free-for-all as far as bedtime and staying up late and sleeping in goes but it's really important that we kind of try to maintain that so if you think about um the summertime when we try to maintain some semblance of a routine um maybe we could approach it that way and say okay well we still need to have kind of a set bedtime we need to still get up in the morning and try to practice those routines if their fear is continuing, if their fear is really persisting, it can be really helpful to point out all the kinds of things that the adults in their world are doing to help prevent COVID from spreading. So hand washing, um, social distancing, um, closing of schools and um, eliminating large gatherings, closing down playgrounds, explain to them that these are ways that we're protecting the most vulnerable of our society. Your kids at this age may want to feel like they can do something. So um, let them do something. Let them do something to help. I've seen some amazing things happening via social media. Um, a local um, by a fiddle player, a violin teacher, Samantha Robichaud, has her students recording themselves playing and then sending that off to nursing homes. That allows those kids to feel like they're doing something to help. Um, write letters. Um, get them to post a video um, about how they're grateful for people. Let them feel like they're contributing to the helping as opposed to sitting fearfully. And that's a really, really important piece for them. If they have any questions, and you can ask them if they have any questions, stick to the facts, right? Um, tell them what you know without exaggerating, without overreacting. And you can use some really great resources to help them understand. And at the end of this um, presentation, I do have some links, but one is really great. It's the Brains On podcast. And they have a podcast called, and I'm just gonna look at my notes here, Understanding Coronavirus and How Germs Spread. And it is elementary age appropriate, and it's a really great one. The other is this really great graphic novel comic piece, which kids of this age love. Um, and it's put out by the Minnesota Public Radio and it's called Just for Kids, a comic exploring the new coronavirus. So you can look those up online. Those are great resources um, for kids of this age. And as we're doing this video, I'm realizing just how much I actually touch my face in real life. So that's elementary, that's preschool, and that's um, toddlers. So let's talk middle school. <sighs> middle school kids are super aware. They're gonna be really aware of what's going on. Many of them will have their own um, smart devices, whether it's iPads or phones or iPods, they may have access to computers, and they've seen the news coverage. They have seen it. They have talked about this with their friends, with, you know, with Snapchat, with, with Instagram, Instagram, with, with Facebook Messenger, with text. They've talked about it. So it's really important to recognize that they are aware. Um, again, talk to them. Try to figure out what they know and how much misinformation they have, right? It's, uh, it's incredible how things get distorted. And if you remember that the game telephone when we were kids and one person tells a story and by the time it gets around the circle, it's a completely distorted and different story. And this can happen at this age, you know, Johnny hears something that his parents are talking about, about the virus and shares it via text to a friend, but 
through his own filter, and that friend shares it in a Snapchat streak with another friend, and so on and so on. And by the time it gets back to your kid, it's a completely distorted message and has nothing to do with the original media message that was shared. So find out what they know or what they, or what they don't know. This is an opportunity to correct that misinformation, provide them with, with real facts. And then just as, as we need as adults to be validated in our experience, acknowledge their feelings, really, really validate what they're feeling and let them know that there's no right way or wrong way to feel about this. They might feel worried or indifferent. They might feel anxious or panicky and that whatever they feel is okay. It's really okay. And it's really important that we just stick to the facts again in this scenario and that we don't kind of um, weigh them down with any kind of dark dystopian future thoughts that we may have. We've read far too many dystopian novels and seen far too many apocalyptic movies. We don't need to share those with our kids. At this age, um, we might see that our kids have some really scary thoughts that they're not articulating. And instead, they're acting out those scary thoughts through misbehaviors, through really um, um, saucy, for lack of a better word, disrespectful, disruptive behaviors. Pay attention to that. Um, some kids might withdraw. They might be spending all their time in their room. The normally garrulous and talkative child might be quiet. The normally really um, pleasant and, and helpful child might become disruptive and disobedient. Be aware, be tuned in, pay attention to those cues and ask them about their feelings. Ask them to tell you, what are you feeling? What's going on right now? I noticed that you're really, you really seem upset. Can we talk about that? Can you tell me about what's going on? Talk to your kids about what they see on TV, what they see online in social media. Um, help them to understand which re resources are reliable and which ones aren't. So if you want to talk with them, um, seek out some positive media and look at it together so that they understand that the information they're getting is reliable. Um, it can be really helpful for them to understand that it's, um, it's responsible to look for those, those legitimate sources of information. Um, Maybe you spend some time together watching, reading, sharing stories about the ways that people are responding to COVID in collaborative and community-based ways. So for example, um, I, saw, uh, I saw a new story where um, different, different truck stops are offering meals to truckers for free. What a great way to talk about sharing community. Or talk about the way that um, a lady here in Moncton um, went into Walmart to buy the groceries for an older couple who were nervous about going in. We can spend some time doing those kinds of things, sharing the positive stories and helping them to understand that despite the fact that it's a little bit scary, that we are building community and being collaborative and keeping our community safe. They already know how to wash their hands. Um, they may be like, oh, I know, I know. Just remind them it's okay. And also encourage them to remember that for part of building good immunity, getting enough sleep and eating properly is also really important. Uh, the two resources that I mentioned when we were talking about elementary students are equally um, valuable for this age group. So again, that's the Brains On podcast, understanding coronavirus and how germs spread. And then Minnesota Public Radio's Just For Kids, a comic exploring the new coronavirus. Those are some really great resources for this age group. So then, whew, who do we talk to? Well, some of us have older kids at home, teens and young adults. This group is getting called out a lot on social media. And I think, you know, it's really important to understand that this is hard for them. Um, in some ways, having teenagers, you know, home during this, this isolation period may not be as labor intensive as having younger kids. Like you're not having to kind of entertain them or keep them engaged or, or monitor their activities, but it comes with its own set of challenges. Younger kids might be really excited about the prospect of having us home 24 seven and completely to themselves, but our teenagers probably are not, right? They're probably feeling quite differently about that as a matter of fact. So, you know, if you have a teenager, adolescent, or maybe a young adult home from university because, because schools have been closed, 
it's really important that we emphasize the social distancing and emphasize the importance of that. This is such a challenge, right? Because they are so used to spending time with each other. And teens in particular can tend to feel invincible, right? The whole notion of 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And they are likely to be well aware that COVID is not as problematic for people in their age group. And so might be because we are egocentric in this in this age range might be feeling well it's okay i'm not going to get so sick and they might be pushing back about that the fact is statistical data is on their side they are not likely to get as sick from coronavirus as older adults are however that doesn't mean that it's not a problem so really emphasizing for them that social distancing is not necessarily to keep them safe as much as it is to keep other people safe, their grandparents. Um, emphasize that it's really not about them, that it's not about um, the individual, it's about the community. And I gotta say, kids right now, that teens and young adults that I've worked with in my practice really are community-minded. They want to do things that are supporting um, healthy communities this is even you know predating covid and so helping them to understand that yes it's hard not seeing your friends but you're doing something really great for our world can be a good way to frame that for them and i think really just validating that they're frustrated is important maybe um emphasizing that you know you can't know that your friends aren't well and I understand that you're upset about not seeing your friends. I know that your friends and your peers are just like your whole world. And it's true, right? That's, that's the valid point. Bonding with their peers is an essential developmental piece. But it's important that they recognize the importance of social distancing. So if your teen or your young adult is sulking about being stuck at home with their parents, um, I, you know what, when I was 15, 16, 17, I would have hated it too. Let's be honest, I would not have loved it. Um, have a direct conversation. Like, these, these young people are old enough to have an honest and open and direct conversation with. Be direct with them, treat them the way you would want to be treated. It's just really helpful. Acknowledge how frustrating it is. Um, encourage them to use other means to communicate. So Snapchat, FaceTime, Skype, um, Facebook video and so on and so forth. This might be a time to loosen maybe some of your strictures around social media for them or around, around screen time so that they can still stay connected with their friends because this is so important for them. As we're getting into more and more time in our social isolation bits, it's going to be really important that we support remote schooling. It's really hard, right? So I think we're in two <laughs> the days are blending together. We're in week two, and we're, we're not quite into that homeschooling piece yet. But it's confusing for parents to try to figure out how to do remote schooling. And with younger kids, it can be easy to find fun activities that are educational. There's been some amazing social sharing on various social media platforms of stories and aquariums and zoos and and you know National Geographic and NASA and, and musicians all sharing arts and cultural events. So that part is easier. But what about what about those older students who are getting ready to graduate or in or in grade you know 10, 11 and are trying to learn? Or what about those those students with exceptionalities, you know, who are maybe missing their usual educational supports? with you know, organization and, and learning difficulties. So this is, this is really completely overwhelming for parents to try to navigate. So as we, as we go through this, um, it might be helpful as we, as we kind of move into maybe some homeschooling stuff. And, and again, we're waiting to, to learn what that will look like. Go through a session yourself, right? Go through a session of the work yourself, experience it, Oh boy, who said we were going back to school? So that we get a sense of what they may experience as they go through it, to find out where the frustration points are. And then don't be afraid to reward your teen with something relaxing after the fact. 
you know, a movie, um, a game, some extra social media time, building in breaks for socializing. Nobody expects homeschooling to look like seven hours a day. It simply isn't, isn't feasible or realistic. So as those things start to roll out, really pay attention to what the educators and the people who, who are pedagogists can tell us about how to support our students' learning. At this age, um, even without a global pandemic, it's really important to encourage healthy habits in our young adults and teens. Um, they will do much better during this stressful time if they're getting adequate sleep, if they're eating healthy meals, and if they're getting um, consistent exercise. Oh wait, so would I, right? So it's the same for all of us, a predictable sleep schedule, getting to bed on a regular time, um, getting exercise. This will help us with our moods and ultimately with more positive academic outcomes. If your young adult or teen is struggling with anxiety in particular, this kind of routine will be very helpful to mitigate that. Um, when they lose a routine that they've become accustomed to relying on, that can be really destabilizing for them. So it's important that if you have set up structure for your, for your teen or young adult who has been living with some anxiety or depression, that we try to maintain those routines as much as possible um, because we want to have a stabilizing effect on our kids as opposed to a destabilizing effect. If your, your child, your teen, your young adult has been in therapy with someone in counseling, look to see if that, if that uh, practitioner is offering telehealth sessions and you know, reach out to continue those, those sessions because that will be important for them as well. Our kids, our, our children, our young adults are gonna be disappointed. Um, I'm seeing you know, kids in grade 12 who are crushed that they may not have their, their grad year stuff. We're seeing theater Pro, um, production, proms, um, grad trips, um, you know, the end of their sports season, um, spending that final grade 12 year with their friends or, or maybe their, their placements in university for practicum or clinical placements. This is, they're missing out on all of these really valid, valuable benchmark experiences. And, you know, for teens who's, who's, brains are ultimately wired to seek out novelty and pleasure. Man, this is hard, right? And as we've, as we've, um, as a culture, as a society kind of conditioned our kids to look forward to these, these experiences. Oh, wait until you get your driver's license. Oh, wait until you get to go to prom. Oh, wait until you get to walk across the stage and get your parchment. To not have those is really, really crushing. Right? And I know that there's, there's all kinds of shaming happening around that. Oh, well, there's worse things in the world happening. But for this age group, that is their world. And just because it isn't globally impactful doesn't mean it isn't emotionally distressing for them. And we really need to sit with them in their disappointment and validate that for them. Say, yeah, I get it, man. This sucks. Don't be afraid to say this really sucks and and help them feel safe to share their sadness their experience their frustration their anger and do this without judgment right it's, it's got to be a judgment-free zone let them feel what they feel they're going to be wondering how this is affecting their futures right they, some of them may be wondering if this is going to impact their their university applications um jobs careers they're scared. We need to sit and hold space for them and allow them to feel what they feel. One of the ways that we can help them is to help them practice mindfulness. And that is really just being in the moment. Um, when we did the four, seven, eight breathing, when we first started, that is a mindful practice. One of the, the elements of mindfulness that is really helpful in times like this, and my colleague Kayla Brelove Carter would have been talking about this in her mindfulness session yesterday, is radical acceptance. This is when we just sit with our emotions rather than fighting them. We tell ourselves that it's okay to feel what we feel. In other words, we sit down and we say, this sucks. I am sad about it. I'm going to be angry about it. I'm gonna feel anxious about it, or whatever, whatever emotion we're feeling. 
we allow ourselves to feel it. We allow our, our, our young person to feel it and allow it to pass through and move on. I sometimes describe this as when we're trying to stuff feelings down, it's like trying to stuff a beach ball under the water. And the more we try to push it down, the more likely it is to come flying up and hit us in the face. But if we just allow the beach ball to kind of pass into our awareness and then pass out of our awareness, it's less disruptive. So the same thing with these negative emotions or un uncomfortable emotions, feel them, acknowledge them, and let them carry on. So as I said, take cues from your child, whatever their age is. Invite them to tell you anything they may have heard, anything they may be wondering, any questions they may be having. Give them that opportunity. You do wanna be prepared to answer those questions, um, but not prompt questions. So our goal ultimately is to avoid encouraging um, fantasies or misinterpretation. A great way to do that is to do our own research, go to the CDC, to the WHO, to the um, Health Canada, and learn as much as we can. In this, we need to be honest. We need to be accurate. In the absence of factual information, children, youth will manufacture scary, scary scenarios, far worse than the reality. So we need to explain that this is what it is, in very brief age appropriate terms. You know, we can tell them that this disease is thought to be spread through close contact or that it's spread through um, infected surfaces or objects, but not expanding on that. It's important that we don't ignore their concerns and that whatever we share with them is absolutely factual. So when we're being honest, um, it's important to remember that if we're making stuff up, our kids are gonna find out eventually, right? They, they, they're smart. And if we make things up, it's going to impact their ability to trust us in the future. So using words and concepts that our kids can understand, we still can be honest. So in that, we're gonna provide them with comfort. Focus on helping them feel safe, but be truthful. If we don't know the answer, say so. And this is an opportunity to, to look up information together. As I mentioned, be calm. Speak reassuringly, speak in a calm tone. Um, give your kids the space to share their fears, to feel what they feel, and, and help them understand um, that it's okay to feel that. And know when they need guidance. You know, you know your kid better than anybody else, so you're the one who's going to know when they need a little more direction pointing them to age appropriate content, um, sharing content with them or searching it up together. For all of us, and this is you know, with our, our daily updates from, from our government, from our chief medical officer of health, we're focusing on what we're doing, not focusing on what we're not doing. So when kids know what they can do to keep themselves safe, then they feel empowered. So Again, talking about the hand washing, about appropriate precautions, about the social distancing, and so on. Um, if they ask about face masks, then explain you know, what um, the experts have told us about that. And it's important to focus on what they can do and what we are doing. With almost any age group, we should be prepared to hit play and repeat. Um, some information might be hard for them to understand, um, some information may be, you know, extra time for processing, but sometimes asking the same question over and over and over again may be a way for them to seek reassurance and to feel, okay, okay, right? So, you know, if you, if you have a child who normally lives with anxiety and they're asking for, are you sure you're going to pick me up at four o'clock? And they ask that repeatedly, it's a reassurance piece. So this is, this is normal, as much as normal can be right now, it is normal that they may do this. And, you know, like I said, our kids are perceptive, um, often more than we give them credit for. Um, younger kids might be wondering why mom and dad are home more than they have been, um, why their routines have changed. They may be wondering about school. And it really is essential that we tackle these questions head on in a manner that both satisfies their curiosity and satisfies their need for security. In order to do that, we need to be reflective. Think about our own feelings and concerns. Um, we may be 
projecting our own insecurities and anxieties on our children. So it's really important that we get our own additional support and guidance at this time, that we have our own places to sit down and be validated, to, to be afraid if we need to be afraid, to be angry if we need to be angry, to be frustrated or disappointed or sad if we need to be. It's important that we've already processed some of our own emotions before we sit with our kids and talk with them. Part of that would be doing our research, making sure that we're using, using appropriate sources for sharing information. And maybe it's talking to a therapist or a counselor. Maybe it's talking to a medical professional. It's about making sure that we have processed stuff be sure, before we share it with our kids. And again, part of that is breathing. Taking that breath before we move on. Getting that cortisol dropped. Getting that sense of calm getting that sense of safety. Because when we do that, we can help our kids feel in control. They can feel safer and know that we're taking care of things. One of the ways that we can help our kids feel in control is to give them specific things to do. Maybe it's extra chores at home because that helps them feel safe. Um, maybe it's getting them to, to talk more. Maybe it's putting those news stories in context, having them do some research, remembering that they will often worry more about their family and their friends than themselves. And again, acknowledging and validating that it's normal to feel stressed out, that it is normal to feel worried and that it's okay. Once again, for all age groups, including us, mom, dad, caregivers, stick to routine. Structured days as much as possible. This will help with feelings of uncertainty and unpredictability. So make sure we're taking care of the basics just like we would during summer vacation or March break and remembering that structure is a safety net. After all is said and done, keep the conversation going. It's probably not enough to have this conversation once with your child, with your teen, with your young adult. We probably need to have this conversation on an ongoing basis. Keep checking in. Um, use this conversation as a way to help your kids learn about their bodies, about it, the immune system and how it fights off disease, to learn about nutrition, to learn about the importance of sleep and, and hygiene. Um, use this as an opportunity to talk about current events and to sit down at the family dinner table and have um, really productive conversations and, and um, encourage them to ask questions about why do things happen and how do things happen. What's interesting is that when we have this conversation, it may encourage conversation about non-news topic. Your kids might be more comfortable talking to you about other things, about things that are happening in their lives outside of COVID. So keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. Keep checking in with your children. Keep talking about current events. Keep having those dinner time, dinner table conversations. Keep sharing, keep reassuring, and keep being calm. So we now have some time to have a few questions. So I'm going to have a look at the chat and see the questions that you guys might have. So I see, uh, CBC The Current will be doing a question and answer episode for children tomorrow. Would this be developmentally appropriate for older elementary students and middle school kids, especially when we don't know what questions will be asked? That's a great question, Fiona. Um, my response would be that The Current is recorded and you could pre-screen it as a parent and given um, what you know now, decide whether you could let your children watch the replay or listen to the replay. And that would be a great way to kind of, kind of do that. Does that answer your question, Fiona? I know this is, this is a really um, confusing time for everyone. I think it's, uh, it's completely uncharted territory. We're all just trying to navigate this the best we can. And I'm so glad that you've popped in here and I hope that this resourcing has been helpful for you. Um, it is confusing. And I think it's really important that we're honest with our kids about, you know what, I don't know everything. I'm confused too. And let's sit down and figure this out together. Um, and you can, you know, check into the CMHA website. There will be other um, webinars coming up like this one. 
and um, also some group programs for frontline workers um, so we can support those who are really supporting us and um, you can check out you know my daily Facebook lives where I give um, some tips for positivity uh, if you do have children that are missing counseling therapy sessions are there other resources they can access if their own counselors aren't available online that's a great question um, so some of the resources that are available currently if you're looking for some great resources around just supporting your kids the child mind institute has some great resourcing um, cam h um, has some great resourcing um, anxiety.org um, has some great resourcing in terms of specific child resources one of the things that i recommend and this would be for younger kids is the go zen program and it's available online and it's it's really about practicing mindfulness calming anxiety and so on these are not specific to covid um, but they're more specific more geared to just you know general anxiety um, if if your children are missing counseling and therapy sessions I would really reach out to your practitioner to find out if they are planning to transition to telehealth um, there is no reason um, that you can't ask the question um, I'm certainly doing that with with all ages that I work with and um, the most important thing if your practitioner is doing telehealth is that your child or young adult feels that they have privacy of their session so I can't emphasize that enough so that, you know, supposing your, your 11 year old has been seeing a therapist and they have transitioned to video sessions, that, you're, that your child does feel like that they still have the freedom to talk as if they were in the therapy room. So making sure that they have a private space, earbuds or earphones, that other family members are removed from the space and are not able to overhear the conversation. So creating that sense of privacy and safety in the home for teletherapy sessions would be very important. Um, so to answer the question around other resources, um, those are the ones that I can think of. If I think of any others, I will post them to, to my Facebook page and to the CMHA page. Share it with teacher colleagues. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will check on that, but I, I should think it wouldn't be um, an issue. Um, if not, feel free to certainly reach out to me um, on your own, and I can certainly share resources with educators. I'm so glad to hear that that um, our educators are looking for those resources, and I know that it's a hard time for teachers not being with their kids, you know, because I know, I know how hard that is. All right, well, if there are no other questions, um, again, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate that you've taken the time to be here today. And I wish you all just um, health and safety and encourage you to continue socially connecting while physically distancing. Um, be well, everyone. And I think we're gonna end the call now.